Right, okay, so um, a good evening to everyone, except uh, to Peter, to whom I will say good day. Um, so yeah, this is um, my mash hopping adventures. Um, this wasn't originally planned to be a talk, it was just me messing around. And then I suddenly thought, hang on, we haven't got, had many talks of, of, well, things like this. So I'll try and turn it into something. Um, so here we go. Um, yeah, so mash hopping. Oh, is it going to work? Oh, it's not working. Oh, no, there we go. Introduction. Introduction. Uh, so what we're going to cover is a little bit about hops. Not very much, because I think we've all been there and done that with, with regards to hops. Uh, a little bit about mash hopping, a little bit about um, what I've discovered on the internet about mash hopping. Um, and then we'll go into um, my experiment and um, talk about what we found out at the end. Um, I take it you can all still hear me. Thumbs up, nodding. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yes. So, hops, an incredibly generalized overview. Okay, so there can't be many home brewers who don't know the purposes of hops in brewing. We use them for bittering aroma and flavour, and they, of course, have um, their antiseptic uh, characteristics as well. And whilst we know the purposes of hops in brewing, we should also know when the hops go in the beer. So we have hops at the start of the boil, mainly for bittering. We have towards the end of the boil uh, for flavour and aroma, um, but you do get a little bit of bittering. Uh, flame out, and that is mainly for aroma and flavour. And again, you'll get a little bit of bittering from that. Um, of course, dry hop post-fermentation addition for adding aroma and flavour. And also first wort, which is the act of adding hops to the copper or kettle with the, with the first runnings from your mash um, before the wort comes to the boil. Um, a lot of people say about first wort, hops that it can lead to a smoother bitterness and that it also contributes a hop flavour similar to that contributed by flame out hops. But what about hops in the mash? Hops in the mash. Or maybe the sparge water. Why not? There's nothing to stop you putting hops really where you want in the beer. You just got to know what's going to happen when you do, right? Okay, so I first um, read about mash hopping in, in Randy Mosh's Radical Brewing about 10 years ago. It wasn't exactly instructive, um, but I had a go at doing it anyway. Um, I had no idea how much to use, so I just went for a small amount uh, because hops were expensive. They certainly were for me back then. Um, and there was no real way of telling what effect it had, if any. It certainly didn't seem to have a bad effect, but you couldn't tell really at all. Um, so why, why have I decided to, to do it again now? Um, well, one of the reasons, um, as we sort of mentioned earlier, is that I have a ridiculous amount of homegrown hops to use up, and I I can't use them up. I've, I've got hops from four years ago in my parents' freezer. I have so many of them. And I started thinking, what am I going to do with all these hops? And then I suddenly thought, hang on a minute. I could stick them all in the mash. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they are, for all intents and purposes, free, except for my own labour. Um, and the second reason is that I acquired one of these Pico brew um, machines, which um, give quite close control for making small batches of beer. So I thought that, that that's idea, ideal for um, experimenting, changing one ingredient at a time and uh, not messing up an entire 20 litre batch. Of course, I've had a good dig around the internet to see what I could glean about mash hopping from brewers' experiences and also in the hope that there may be some references that would point me towards academic or historic materials. Um, there's a bit of mash hop chatter 
but what I found was a lot of people perpetuating the same unreferenced anecdotes such as you know it's a waste of hops and then most of them have said oh I haven't tried it but I've heard it's a waste of hops um so obviously you you believe they believe that and you, you know might as well just I don't know, call it a day really um there there is uh, there was one article that I sort of found that a few other people were referring to I couldn't find the original of it um but it was um did have a reasonably in-depth discussion of a mash hopping experiment. It wasn't scientific particularly, um, but it was a, a similar sort of experiment. And this was by a chap called Mark Seedham, and that was, but that was back from 2004. And he, I've tried to research something on him, but he doesn't really come up other than he's somebody that wrote brewing articles for brewing techniques and zymergy, like back in them days, um, but it doesn't appear um recently um but essentially it's quite hard to find you know hard scientific or historical um evidence certainly on the internet um and then of course i did have a look at philosophy even they haven't done an experiment on it um so i thought well how am i gonna how am i gonna find out if there is actually any real history to this. Um, I thought I'd better approach one of our sort of eminent beer historians. Um, so I got in contact with um, Mr. Ron Pattinson. Now I thought if anybody was gonna know anything about um, historical mash hopping recipes, um, he was gonna know something. Um, so during during the course of my um, internet research, I did see a few mentions of Berliner Weisse um, and mash hopping. So yeah, I thought, right, I'll ask Ron, see if he, and he, and he got back to me. Um, and he said that he couldn't remember having ever seen um, mash hopping being used in, in British recipes, but he did know about um, mash hopping in Berliner Weisse. Um, but as you would expect, um, Berliner Weisse mash hopping was not to extract the flavour from the hops. As we know, Berliner Weisse is not really a sort of hop flavour heavy beer, is it? Um, but they were, apparently they the hops were used uh, to aid loutering and as also for their general sort of antiseptic um, use. Um, so what did we find out? Um, not to go give you full descriptions of um, of everything like to do with Berliner Weisse, but I, I, I've sort of got some examples from, from Ron and sort of translated them into something which I will um, attempt to um, read to you. Now, there are three, three different methods of mash hopping here from this book called Die Fabrikation Ober Gariger Beer und Praxis und Theory by Braumaster Grinnell in 1907 okay um sorry about the german um but essentially um what i could glean from what ron sent me that this is about four four methods here um so method one is if i can actually move you all so i can read this off the screen uh, is to boil boil the hop charge with the strike water for five minutes before mashing in mash at 35c Method two was quite difficult to reinterpret. It was a very, very long description, and I had to read it quite a few times to try and figure out what it was actually saying. But apparently there's mashing in the kettle. Um, once the bottom of the kettle is covered, add the hop charge, mash for one hour at 30, then raise to 65 before draining half the mash into the mash tun. So you mash in the kettle, then you put it in the mash tun. Right. Uh, then you slowly boil what's left in the kettle for half an hour at 60 before mashing out at 77. And then you presume that the two works are combined afterwards. Now I'll have to move to you all again up there. Um, method three, mash in the pan. Again, I presumed it was in the kettle. This is just the translations that I, I was dealing with. Uh, 35 to 37 for half an hour. Slowly heat to 52, then add the hop charge rest for 30 minutes then heat to 77 so we got three different ways there that you could potentially um put the hops in the mash um i only tried one way but we'll get to that um later on um 
a method four. Now this was the, the earliest reference I got to um, um, mash hopping um, from 1773 in the um, economic encyclopedia. I'm not gonna attempt the German for that. Um, these hops he infuses in warm water and then pours into the kettle and lets them boil with the mash. While the thin mash is boiling, the brewer empties the thick mash with the schuppen, uh, which is a kind of large copper bucket apparently, into the zapfbotic, uh, a tapping tub, uh, after first fitting a crown of straw around the tap and laying mashholzer, which is an excellent word, uh, mashing sticks. Uh, boards with holes and a layer of straw at the bottom of the zapf botic. Uh, when the thin mash has been properly boiled in the kettle, it is added to the thick mash. The boiled mash is poured through a hop basket of giant braids fixed to two poles, which lies resting on its poles on the zapf botic and is lined with straw, which retains all the hops in the basket. The thick and thin mashes now stand mixed together for three hours in the zapf botic. During this time, all the strength is extracted from the malt. Uh, now, one of the things that I noticed from, from these references is that they all tended to talk about boiling, um, but it seems fairly clear that no boiling was actually involved here. Um, it just seems to be a, a, a generic um, term they've used for uh, warming the water, warming the mash. Um, so there you go. So there's there's the the historical uh, precedent for, for 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 mash hopping, but probably not in the way that um, I intended to investigate. Um, so on on to on to um, my little experiment. Now, when I decided to try uh, mash hopping, I wasn't thinking about Berliner Weisse because I didn't know about it, any of that stuff up there that we just um, looked at. Um, but I wanted to know whether hopping the mash would add another layer of flavour to the beer. I was pretty sure it could, but in order to find out, I would have to brew a beer which only featured hops in the mash. That's how it started. Then I realised that it would be useful to have some sort of comparison beers to measure it against. So I thought, well, we'll brew a couple of other very simple beers so we can um, examine the sort of the differences between between the hopping so the um, one of the beers was a, a simple uh, 60 minute edition a normal bittering edition and the other one was as mentioned earlier uh, a first wort hopped edition as there was the first wort hop flavor and mash hop flavor according to the internet are supposed to be quite similar-ish, so I thought it would be a good way of comparing them. Um, so yeah, the Pico was the was what I brewed these on, um, just be, just because it was easy to easy to set the automatic controls. Um, I'm sure you could do this sort of thing on on any of these like um, you know brew brewmaster thing type things now. Anyway, um, but looking at the control. Um, to ensure the beers were as close as possible to being identical, except for the hopping, uh, I used the same water treatment, grain bill, yeast, hop variety, mash and boil durations, brew length, intended original gravity, I should say, and intended IBU. Um, the only way I could, of course, me well, couldn't, you can't really measure the IBU, but you can you can take what what beer smith suggests, and and even if you put um put hops down to for to go into the mash, it seems to it comes up with some calculation. Um, how accurate that is, I don't know, but I used that as the basis to say, okay, all these beers are going to be around or as close as I can get to forty IBU. So they're not too bitter, they're not too sweet. Um, so you'll see when I show the recipes in a second, like uh, now, um, what what we did. So for all the uh, the the technical geeks out there, um, that that's what I did. Um, for the the recipe for for each beer was identical except for when I put the hops in. And for anyone who's really geeky, there's the uh, there's the uh, water profile there from um, Brewing Water 
Um, <clears throat> Just a quick note that on the water chemistry as well, that, that really wasn't that accurate, mainly because nobody's really properly nailed down a, um, a Pico brew um, mash profile yet. Um, but for all intents and purposes, all the beers used that same um, water, pro water profile. Um, you'll notice then... Sorry, Ken, Ken can I ask you... It did you really have 340 ppm of sulfate in that beer? Um, yes, I, I attempted to um, to get that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I didn't measure it in a lab, but yeah, that's what um, that's what the, the calculator su suggested um, I would have. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're getting quite a lot of sulfate from the CRS as well as then from the gypsum yeah yeah no i just i just wanted to to check that on my eyes and not deceiving me <laughs> yeah no they're not no um yeah i don't really want to go into it, that that side of it really but um no 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 yeah. it, like I, I wasn't gonna ask um absolutely not i might ask you later but separately yeah yeah fine um okay so you'll see then so how much how many hops, or how, what's, what weight of hops did I have to stick in the mash for, um, you know, five litre batch? 150 grams. That's at the rate of uh, uh, 30 grams a litre. Um, don't see that these days. Um, yeah, so that's, that's quite a lot of hops to, uh, hops alone you know took up quite a lot of space in the uh, in in the the there uh, here, here's some nice pictures for you so there's me weighing the hops out it's that big lump there that's the hops then sitting on top of the uh of the grain and then after i've um mashed them in um with that fish slice which actually makes an excellent mash paddle um and um yeah i have to say that the mash smelled amazing really really amazing um more amazing than normal um so if you want to have a closer look at that there we go um one a couple of things that i did differently with the beers is that this, with the second and third beers those as those are the ones that weren't mash hopped um i transferred uh, the hot bags from from the brewing chamber to the corny for recirculation um, to account for the fact that if I'd been brewing on a full scale, the hops would have still been in there at recirculation, whereas the mash hop wouldn't have been in the boil at all. Um, so I did that to, to, um, to try and um, sort of keep the, the hop character through at the end. Um, afterwards, um, all the beers were run off into separate um, mini cornies to cool overnight. Once they were cool, uh, five grams of yeast pitched direct, uh, and I didn't bother to rehydrate it. Uh, five grams is more than enough for uh, for a small little batch like that, where you're getting less than less than five liters. Um, there were some slight differences in in OG um, that I can't really account for, considering that that all the measurements of grain and um, strike water were identical for all the beers. Um, the black box effect of the Pico, um, something like that. Um, oh, that's, that's, what, that's the, uh, the recipes for the control beers, just to, just to show you the difference. So we've gone from 150 grams of hops in the mash to like 23 grams for first work and uh, 25 grams for, um, for just boiling for 60 minutes um, i left all of all the brews for seven days and then i bottled them uh via a bottling stick on a steel racking cane and a demijohn which i used just to mix in the priming sugars um for an unknown reason the, the beer with the 60 minute edition finished at 10.008 whereas the other two finished at 10, 0, 12. Again, no idea why that was, considering, say, all things were equal. Um, it's one of those things. 
um, could even be down to the shape of the, the keg, I suppose. I mean, who who knows? Um, so, yeah, where do we get to? What happened at the end? What were the results like? Now, before I go on to the results, I have to say that for this experiment, I don't actually know what the results are like. So I, because I, I brewed it, because I brewed it a second time. The first time I brewed all these beers, um, after I'd been brew brewed and I went back and checked my records, um, it didn't tally with um, with the hops that had disappeared from my brewing fridge. And then I realized that I may have accidentally used the wrong hop variety in one of the beers. So I obviously didn't want to um, use that then. I thought it would you know, potentially give a false impression um, if you're trying to do a, a vague, some sort of vaguely controlled experiment. Um, so I just thought, well, I'll just really brew them all and I'll, you know, I'll just be a, a bit more careful, essentially. Um, so that's what I did. So in two weeks time, if you come to the to the November meeting, I'll be bringing along um, the actual samples from uh, from this experiment. Whereas I'm currently drinking some of the samples from the previous experiment. I'll tell you what my observations were from the previous experiment, not from this one, okay? So what I found from the mash hop edition uh, was we got definitely got aroma, we definitely got flavour, and we got some bittering. I don't know whether it was as bitter as Beersmith said it was going to be, but it wasn't too far off the mark i think um definitely more flavor than than the beer with this with the bittering addition as, as as you would probably expect um now with the first work um beer it's quite an interesting comparison because the intensity of of the aroma and flavor was quite similar uh, but i found that the mash hop beer the aroma was much more um, kind of raw, like when you get the when you get the handful of fresh hops and you know you, and you give them a really good whiff. I mean, it wasn't as strong as that, but it had that kind of character to it. Whereas the first work um, flavor was definitely quite rounded, quite smooth. Um, you know, they were both uh, they were both very 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 nice actually. Um, so essentially what what i've seen from one from one batch is that um also two batches now the second one that we haven't looked at but shoving a load of hops into your mash gets you aroma and flavor that carries through to the end of the beer now this would appear to be against received brewing wisdom which should say that those uh, volatile aromatics will get boiled off um, but they don't. So, so why, why don't they? Um, okay, so this article that I, that I referred to earlier on by this chap called Mark Seedham, he thinks he, he came up with a theory, he came across, had the similar results. Um, so he wanted to know why, why, why does it work? And his theory um, is, is, is basically, um, he says that, um, the, the, the volatile hop oils be, become stabilized after being exposed for extended periods at pH levels and temperatures found in the mash, as opposed to slightly more acidic and higher temperatures than would be found in the boil. Now, this is apparently in based on or some statements found in the um, in the textbook of of the classic textbook of brewing by Jean de Klerk from um, 1957. Um, um, Seedham says in his article that th this is what, what he quoted from de Klerk, and that is hop aromatic oils form permanent chemical bonds at higher pH values and lower temperatures than found in boiling wort. But wait a minute, okay? Because I have a copy of this book because of uh, the bequeathal from um, the late Aunt Hayes's wife. Um, 
So I thought I'd get the book out and try and find what he's talking about, because it would be good to have the actual reference. Because I was unable to get hold of the original article. I had no reference to any page numbers or anything other than it said Jean de Klerk, 1957. Right, so I thought, well, I've got to find it in there, really, haven't I? So I got the books out, started looking through them, read a, read a few chapters on hops, read a few chapters on, on boiling, um, and I didn't. You know, I couldn't find that quote in there anywhere. I couldn't find anything that resembled um, what um, Seedham has quoted. So I don't know whether it's because he was sort of reading between the lines, um, and I sort of attempted to do that, and I really still couldn't even really infer infer that from what I read. Um, so maybe it's just me and I've somehow managed to miss it, although I did read those chapters now several times to make sure I understood every word. Um, maybe it's in another part of the book. I don't know. Anyway, as I say, I've got no page reference, so I can't, I can't properly track it down. Um, so it does look like potentially um, it's, I don't know, not true, possibly. But there's also the fact that we still have to, to look back on, say, well, it does actually work. And there's got to be a reason for that. Um, and if it is something like this, it, it would sort of stand to reason. It would make it would make sense. I mean, I, I would buy it. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm a I'm a, a simpleton. But I guess it does, does show that it, that, it, that it pays to try and go back to original sources sometimes. Um, Anyway, so going away from that, at the end of it all, what do we know? We, we know that it works. Um, it was okay, it was a very small sample size, and I'd be really interested to see some results from much larger experimentation. Um, but one of the good things it's done now is it's given me um, an idea of exactly the, the, the type and character of aroma and flavor that I would get from mash hopping. So I know what to look out for when I'm, when I'm tasting future beers that I, that I experiment with. Um, so I think the next thing to do is probably, um, you know, sort of, you don't, I don't really want to do another mash where I put 150 grams in, in, in that small box, because I mean, that was really only so that I didn't have to put any hops in another part of the brew. So now I think what we'll do is move some of the bittering hops back to the boil. And then once you've done that, so you can get more of a sort of a definite bittering, you can then play around a bit more with the layering, um, maybe put the hops in the sparge water, maybe heat them up first. There's lots of possibilities there, I think. Um, and I, did, I had some thoughts about, um, potentially using this method on a on a neeper to get some um some extra flavor in there um because you wouldn't get the bitterness you get all the softness of the of the um, the aromatic oils um and i've never even made a neeper anyway so i might not know what i'm talking about um but okay <laughs> at the end of that pretty much sums up the presentation so all we can say is if you've got a big bucket load of hops and you didn't know what to do with them you do now. Ends. Awesome, mate. Looking forward to the event. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> no questions. I was going to say, like, do you think the so you said it was kind of like you got that raw bit of a raw hot flavour coming through, and I'm I'm fascinated to taste this. Mm. Um, could it be down to just the sheer volume of hops that you put in the mash compared to the beer which didn't have that? I'm, I'm kind of like, obviously you did it based upon IBU. Um, yeah. I wondered if you did like, and obviously I don't think. 40 grams or, or how, sorry how many it wasn't it wasn't an awful lot of grams in, in the uh in the regular beer no they were um, like 25 in the 60 minute edition and 23 in the first word edition yeah so you're, you're not going to get that for, if you put that in the mash you're not going to get that raw oh no of course not yeah level, so. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, as I say, it's, there are a, a few different ways I could have sort of run the experiment, really. But the main thing was I wanted to have enough of a hop charge from the mash that it would bitter the beer as well, um, because also I wanted the beer to be drinkable. Um, and I want, and I didn't want to then have to put hops somewhere else in that brew, which might then detract from what I'd put in the mash. So, so yeah, as you say, the only way of really sort of getting a, a good measure on it was to go, well, I'll just go for the same IBUs um, across the board. That way I can at least assess the bitterness, but, mm. but yeah, for, for absolutely. You know, you put 150 grams of, of, of hops in the mash, it's going to, it's going to carry through, but you don't need to put that much in. That's what, that's what the point of it is. If you're look, you're just looking for, really, you're looking for a subtlety here. You're looking for a different way of getting, of getting a flavour into or extra hop flavour into your beer without using, you know, without potentially, you know, people can over hop beers and they turn out really grassy and all that kind of stuff. And I think potentially if you, you, went, you took this approach, um, you wouldn't get that. Um, and there's the... It's 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 kind of like risk free dry hopping in a way. Mm. Um, I mean, you'd have to use more more sort of um, more sort of hops, but you don't risk um, putting oxygen into your beer at the end. Um, you don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, as, as I say, there's 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 lots of ways you could play around with this. And if you are and if you are someone who's genuinely been trying to like pass off hops to people because you don't know what to do with them then why not in your next brew stick them in the mash and see what happens how did you work out um the ibus in the mash again did you have a calculator or just for because 150 grams is a lot yeah i just used beersmith oh okay. so there's a and whatever numbers that i plugged in and the numbers that came out the other end was the numbers that i went with i mean i'd really no other way of yeah. of of deciding I, I did look for it to see if there were some calculations for it online but there but yeah i mean it's it, i mean mash hopping seems to be one of these things that's just just seems nobody just nobody really does it or talks about it and there's no real like scientific evidence out there and that or analysis that's that's been proper analysis that's been done so, so is there really just throw stuff at at beersmith and um right. see what comes out the other end and I, as, as I, I say it seemed to it seemed to be roughly okay i'd say it probably isn't as quite as bitter as um beersmith has calculated it it might be off by five six ibu but it's definitely um it definitely isn't a, a sweet beer to drink i haven't seen it is there a mash hopping setting in beersmith yes oh i see right okay yeah. Well, you know, when you go to put the hops in, you can just put select mash. Right. Okay. Yeah, I've just checked it now. It's in there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I've done it with the Beersmith one and it like, I can't measure it, but it, it tasted about right. Mm. right. What it came out with seemed accurate enough. So you've tried it, have you, Rob? Yeah. I, when okay. I was making a raw rail, so like with no boiling and I thought, well, get some hops in there, like anyway, and yeah, it, it, you, you, you did get at least the sensation of bitterness out of it. Mm. So, surprisingly. So, Ken, you reckon you reckon you get more more flavour than bitterness, as it were, from mash hopping as as a, akin to first work hopping. So all those oils getting dissolved. Oh yeah, yeah, the, definitely. I mean, you you definitely don't want to put hops in the mash if you're trying to extract bitterness i mean that that is definitely a complete waste yeah um because you, you can extract bitterness by putting you know a tenth of the amount of hops in at 60 minutes um but yeah if you it's it, it's purely for getting an interesting other layer of flavor out of it and the fact that it actually comes across in the beer and doesn't yeah. get boiled away is 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 one of the one of the more interesting things of course the same thing the same sort of rule then sort of seems to apply to the first work hops which of course have the same effect as immediately coming into contact with wort of a lower ph from the first runnings yeah 
and sitting there until they get to boiling temperature. So it's, it's they're kind of going through a similar sitting in the, in a sort of a similar process. And, and then of course they stay in the boil. Yeah. Um, so, the, so some of their flavors get rounded off. So you're taking the hops out before the boil. I, I would think there's a continuum there because you've got the the mash is at let's say at the end of the mash it's around 70 77 um and if you uh first wort hop and you put it in at 70 77 mm. it's the same thing so yeah. I, yeah. I i i would just see that as just being a little bit earlier in the process Exactly, exactly. You've, by doing it in the mash, you've subjected it to that process for an extra hour. Um, whereas if you do put first, first work, you're subjecting them only to, for the amount of time it takes the work to come to the boil, depending on your brew length, will be X, Y, or Z. So are you taking the hops? So the, the hops don't end up in the boil then? No. No. So, you're not, so another reason you're not getting any bitterness out of them? As Peter says, you're getting all the flavour. Yeah. First word, I mean, but you not know, the bitterness, because they're exactly. not. Exactly. The, you could the get, you could put them into the boil, but you'd have to have a think of a different way of uh, yeah, mash right. You'd yeah, probably, yeah. you could do it by, you could, you could put them in like a big bag, um, sink them to the bottom, put them on the on in a big wide bag, put them at the bottom of your mash tun, and then mash on top of them. And then once you've emptied the mash tun after sparging, you could then lift the bag out. And dump them in the boil but obviously while, if, while the hops are all mixed in like i did it well yeah you're definitely not putting them in the mash and not unless you're doing a, a full decoction <laughs> which i'm sure Rob, so, rob's probably up for. So i see what you mean i see what you mean yeah. about it being a kind of neeper so like a reverse hopping to do a neeper so you get mm. no bitterness but all the flavor by doing it Mm. in the mash and not letting it anywhere near the boil mm. yeah I mean, you could work. like just you could do that sort of thing like supercharge uh, the mash yeah. and then yeah. dry hop it but nothing in between wow okay that would be just really an idea. yeah yeah because you get i've done first work hopping quite a bit on and off and surprised how much flavor does pop out i think yeah yeah um by, with that method so that Yes, yeah, so what you were suggesting, doing it in the, the mash and then dry hopping, you would get quite a different hop profile. Really yeah. smooth and aromatic, but yeah. very low bitterness. Yeah. A very smooth bitterness. Mm. Do you think do you think you could do uh, first work hopping, but could, could you leave it at, say, 70, 77 degrees for an hour? So after it extends your brew day, but what yeah. if you if you mash and then just hold it, so you get the time that you've just spent, Ken, on your, uh, you know, mashing in. But then you you your your hops last into the boil. You just you just hold it before raising it. I wonder what that would do. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's nothing to stop you doing that. I suppose um, I'm not sure how you calculate that exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're, yeah, you're, I mean, you yeah, break it, Craig. You might have to do something like this. I, I will let you know. <laughs> but on, on basically, um, all my commercial brews, I had to first work hop them, um, basically to stop it foaming over. Um, so if I didn't first work hop, the kettle would overflow. If I first work hopped, it stayed within the kettle. So yeah, all of my commercial brews were first work hopped. And yeah, it took over an hour to get to boil. So you're gonna you're gonna learn that, Craig. Right. <laughs> so yeah, sim similar sort of thing. And yeah, I, I did find that yeah, whatever hops you put in as first foot hops, you got a lot of flavor contribution from there. Not much bitterness, but yeah. Well, you did get bitterness, but it was more the more rounded like you expected. Um, I never did any, ex any experiments the other way around without doing it um, just for pure commercial reasons as in when I waste any of the beer going over the end of the kettle. I'm actually surprised um, even like how characterful the, the beers are with, with just the first word hops. Yeah, I, mean, these, I love these, first word hops. These easily yeah. pass without sticking any more hops in as a, as a 
very good quality like um english pale ale like yeah. the hops really really come out of it and was quite surprised <laughs> yeah i found that as well Daz and, and ken that i've um i've done that with lagers i think and done a first work hop and then a bittering charge and then an aroma thing at the end and 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 thought I've massively over hopped it somehow, <laughs> and put it down to the first word hops mm. because I was in. I ended up putting like a third, like you do, like a third of it in the first word hops for that. For as you say, Peter, that like that half an hour where it's where, it, where it's reaching the boil. Um, there's a lot of flavour ends up in there that I kind of wasn't expecting in a lager but um slightly over flavored it but um but for, for other things like a pale ale would be fantastic I mean, the it. only danger i think with the first work ones and i've experienced this before is that if you if you massively undershoot your gravities you're going to end up with a beer a lot more bitter than you intended um without or you're going to have to find a way of creating some more work to stick in there uh, like have a bag of um DME on hand just in right. case you need to add a few gravity points yeah. to the beer. Yeah. No, uh, this uh, is where um, a refractometer comes in really handy because it should literally take a couple of drops, stick it in, and have a, and have a look where you're where you're at. That is the only use for a refractometer that I have is that you know post mash because mm. it's all mixed in anyway because you've been sort of, uh, you know you've been uh, putting it in, but. Um, I'm thinking oh, this sorry. After you. I, I was saying I think in this technique probably only works for whole hops. No, well, I mean I, I only used whole hops, but apparently, I mean, this guy who wrote this article, um, I can send it on to anybody if they if they if they're interested. Um he he said that he had made like done it over 10 times and um he he found that pellets worked better. Um I mean, they would certainly work better, I should imagine, if I'm using the Pico, because it was a bit of a squeeze getting 150 grams of hops into that small box. Um, but I guess because, yes, similarly, as people say for dry hop, um, that, you know, um, pellets work better because there's, there's more surface area exposed, isn't it? Um, yeah. Peter, well, it's, it's definitely Peter, something I'm going to I'm going to try. Yeah. Peter linked to a um, uh, beer and brewing article. Um that basically said, yeah, if you use pellets, it works much the same way, but you can get a bit more bitterness from powder carryover. Ah, uh, right. Um, yeah. But yeah, and that's from Matt Brendelson, the Firestone Walker guy. Yeah, so yeah I read that article, actually. Yeah, yeah. My question, sorry, hi Ken, I'm one of oh, the yeah. new guys. I am I'm more interested in your hop variety because I'm also from Croydon. Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. Tell, tell, <laughs> tell, tell me that tell me that that's an overgrown jungle somewhere that I can go and pick hops, please? Or is that, is, do, can you buy them from the Mort Miller? Um, no, that's <laughs> my homegrown. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got, yeah. So earlier I've got. Um, what is it? The, what is the variety mix you think um, you've got? It's uh, Early Bird, which is um, a Goldings variety, and okay. Cascade. I've got Nugget as well up the other end of the garden, but it's easy, it's easier to keep that one separated from the other two. But yeah, the Cascade and the and the early birds tend to get mixed in together and you get a kind of a sort of a marmalade sort of Earl Grey type sort of um, effect from them. Very nice. Thank you. A breakfast beer. Yes. <laughs> oh, I could put some toast in there, maybe. Look at that. Look at that. Mm. Someone's already done that. Yeah, we, we had them come and talk, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we did. Slightly salty beer. It was yeah. nice. And we said, we all said, it's nice beer, but you should definitely make a dark beer. It would work better. So they completely ignored us, of course, and carried on <laughs> making pale beers. Yeah. Isn't it full of diacetyl as well or something? Is it? I haven't had one for ages. I, I, no, it's got a lot better. The stuff in the shop mm. is all right, but the one they brought, if I remember, there was some fault 
and they were like oh, oh yeah. and that's bad is it <laughs> like you're well, right yeah whoever brews right. it yeah. for you and tell them it's full of diacetyl and see what they say <laughs> Guys, um, thank you all. I've been missing the whole lab catch up, but uh, I'm afraid I have to shoot for today. Uh, Ken, thanks for the presentation. And I do look forward to trying and tasting and mm. you know, having my uh, mind blown. Yep. Awesome. See you then. Take care. Cheers, Cheers, Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ken. That was awesome. Yeah. Was awesome. And I'm, I'm looking forward Brilliant. to the first. My pleasure.